We're back at the British Motor Museum for the second part of our Rustival video, an event organised by Ian and Carly from Hubnut, Matt from Furious Driving and Steph from iDriver Classic. The Audi Quattro is a car which I don't think will ever leave my bucket list. Be it a 10 valve like this one or the 20 valve, the sound of a 5 cylinder is incredible when you let it off the chain. Even if I'd got one, I'd still want another, and another, and probably one more after that. I used to have an Audi 80 Sport, but it was a mid-90s B4. I'd like a B2, but I prefer an estate, and unlike its B1 and B3 neighbours, the B2 is never available in a long roof configuration. But of course, it does look better with rally lights, as does everything. Two of quite a number of Citroen BX that turned up to Rustable, these clean looking phase 2 examples showing the up and down of their hydro pneumatics, and they won't be the last in this episode. And just a little bit further down from them, this Sport Prince was actually a Bertoni design, and after the coupe they made a Roadster which didn't use the normal 600cc inline 2, but instead came with a 1 litre Wankel rotary instead. Parked it by these E-types, it really doesn't look like a bad design at all. Moving up in scale from the Sport Prince a little bit, this Mercedes 420 SE, based on the W126 saloon platform, is one of my favourite Mercedes. And then moving back down in scale, but continuing the luxury theme, is this Metro, which might be a bit of a surprise, but this is a Vanden Pla, an upmarket trim level usually associated with the larger saloons from British Leyland and Daimler. This particular example is from the last year the Metro Vanden Pla was made, and as it's a manual, actually has nine extra horses horsepower than the automatic model. This may be the most famous BX on YouTube, currently owned by David at Indecisive Auto, and was previously owned by Richard of Up and Down, so if you'd like to see more of its restoration, check out their links in the description down below. Next to VEP is a smart crossblade, the roofless, mostly doorless, windscreenless version of the Smart 4.2. But this one has Tennessee number plates. Rustable was just one stop on Jim and Sean from Also Driven's journey from Europe to the Lane Motor Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. You can check out more of the journey and the car on the Also Driven YouTube channel, which is also linked down below. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe here and hit the notification bell to get notified when all of our episodes go live. Singer is a hugely popular trials car from the interwar period, in part thanks for its extremely close ratio gears and light weight. Next to it is the UK equivalent to the Model T, the Austin 7. Cheap, practical and ubiquitous in its time. Hey everyone, my name's Tom, Project 40 Cars, and this is my Fiat Panto HGT in all of its multi-yellow glory. Not a single yellow panel is the same shade, but that's what gives cars character, I think. Um, what I've done to it uh, is quite a lot. Uh, when I first bought it in June of last year, it had had um, a hard life, I think, as a lot of unloved hot hatches from the early 2000s had had owned uh, 10 previous owners um, just hadn't had any work it was just in a sorry state of affairs and I thought well no that's the car for me unloved hard to get parts for paid a little bit more than I should have done this is my project car so the things I've done stock from the factory is 130 brake horsepower 0 to 60 and I think about 8.5 seconds now it's probably just about the same because I think the modifications I've put on have brought it back up to factory speed after 20 plus years. Um, I've got a Super Sprint manifold on the front, a uh, Ultra Sport back box on the rear. I did, did have a straight pipe exhaust, which I then realized was a horrifically bad idea for a 40 year old man because it was so epically loud um, that it was making my ears bleed after doing some long distance drives. So I've been all sensible and then had a middle silencer put back in, which has, I think, diminished the power somewhat and made it um, a little bit slower off the line. But I have my hearing, so I'm calling that a win. Other than that, um, I bought a spare punto to get a, um, this lovely R-Bath body kit, which does absolutely nothing performance-wise, but looks so much cooler. It has like more more air that can get in and more power or something like that, probably not. But this was a um, non-performance uh, optional extra that was a dealer fit um, on the Panto HGT. You get these lovely Arbath covers, 
Look at that. Oh, gorgeous. Um, the uh, front bumper and the uh, side skirts as well. Um, the donor car also had the wheels and the interior and the steering wheel. So I basically stole all of those parts, put all of my old parts into that car and then sold that car to a subscriber uh, who's uh, still using it to this day, which is really, really nice. Um, what else? Uh, road trips wise, we've been to Wales. Uh, we're planning to do a lot more sort of road trips. I'd like to take this down to Italy, if I can, go to the, the, the Fiat Museum um, later this year, which should make it. I mean, this car has been surprisingly reliable, definitely the most reliable car in my fleet compared to my <laughs> compared to the Cryan, my Porsche Cayenne Turbo S. Um, this has been just perfectly reliable, has never broken down apart from once in a car park, but that was just a coil pack that wasn't screwed in correctly. Which I'm not, you know, after 20 plus years, I'm not gonna judge it too harshly for having a Duff coil pack. After that, it's, I'm trying to think what else on it. I think that's pretty much everything we've done. You know, we've done servicing, we've done modifications. Now, it's just a case of just using it. Getting that, a project car to that final stage of actually being just usable and not needing much done on it. So that's the plan for this year, is just go to car shows, do a bunch of driving, and just enjoy the vehicle and hopefully hopefully not break down oh and one other thing we have done is this lovely from a distance red paint job on this engine cover um, that alone adds 10 brake horsepower did you know the 145 originally started with boxer engines before it got the twin spark i didn't next to it there's a very early r50 mini and a super clean looking volvo 740 complete with prancing moose sticker just further down, this fantastic Carina, and I love the colour, apparently a rattle can respray. It looks fantastic. And thanks to the previous owner, there are a few modifications. A tow bar and an immobiliser are all fairly normal. Even the starting handle gets a pass, but the hand throttle and the torch illuminated speedo are definitely pretty unique. The MG Roadster of 1967 was originally built with a 1.8 litre B-series engine, but this 1995cc registered example has either been bored out or maybe engine swap. Let me know in the comments if you know anything more about this one. I'm not sure how yellow Ford Focus sometimes seems so common. Because of the 3500 that were made, that's still 0.4% of the actual production volume. If ever there was a colour that defined an era, Avocado would definitely define the 70s, and this SD1 2600 Series 1 may be the last one in this colour. This car's been driven by Steph, and there's a video of it on iDriver Classic's channel. Check it out if you'd like to see more. You can watch more of this car on their channel along with many other projects that pass through their workshop and their fleet. This 240 is around 80mm lower, has a complete reupholstering along with a couple of other external modifications including new lights and a chunky ducktail on the boot lid. Beyond that, it's still running the same B230 carved from the factory. Among the things at Rustville that I didn't know existed until this visit was this Nissan Micra Cabrio. Long before the 2005 Micra C Plus C, which did come to the UK, this K11 Cabrio was made purely for the Japanese domestic market and sold as the Nissan March. It debuted in 1997 with a 1 or 1.3 litre engine and a 4 speed automatic or a CVT gearbox. It's even got an electric roof which still functions perfectly, as you'd probably expect as well as a mini-disc multi-changer in the glove box from the factory. The interior itself is exceptionally 90s and still has rear seats despite losing a bunch of space to that roof mechanism. These two Morris Travelers might look very similar but there's multiple iterations between them. The body had a few minor changes but the biggest change is mechanical with the Series 5 packing the improved 1.1 litre A Series engine. Two more cars you can catch on YouTube, this Sirocco is from Wrenching Wench and parked next to it is JM on Cars Ferrari, both looking really great in the sun. There was so much to walk around I didn't even get into the museum this visit and barely saw the upper car park, but that's coming in the next episode. Subscribe to the channel to make sure that you get notified when the final part of our first Rustable visit goes up with even more cars just like these. Thanks once again to Ian and Carly from Hubnut, Matt from Furious Driving and Steph from iDriver Classic for putting this on. 
All the channels are mentioned in the description, so check out their videos if you haven't already. Subscribe to them as well as ourselves, and we'll see you in the next video.